we're about to begin scattering of quantum mechanical waves and when a wave scatters it becomes spherical. It's always plausible to consider an incoming plane wave but once that plane wave arrives at a scattering center the outgoing wave is going to have spherical components to it. So I'll begin by sketching the plane wave. We'll consider propagation along the Z axis. That's just the axis. The wave can be depicted by wave fronts going along the z-axis, where each one of these vertical lines represents a crest in the wave, which may be sinusoidal along the z-axis. There's a propagation vector k, which is perpendicular to the plane wave front and points in the direction that the wave is propagating. Now we went over before why this plane wave is represented with e to the i k z. If I just consider a point somewhere on the z axis and I look at a point on the wave front and I look at another point on the wave front, these lines I just drew are r vectors. And there are wave propagation vectors normal to that wave front. At every given point on the plane, k dot r is just kz. If I want to mathematically depict the plane wave, I'll say it's an amplitude times an exponential. An important thing to know about plane waves is that you cannot normalize them because they have infinite extent. In the x and y directions, these planes go on forever. And in the z direction, the way it's depicted mathematically, it goes on forever in a periodic manner. So what's often done when plane waves are used is normalization is still accomplished by defining bounds in the x and y direction for where the plane wave can exist because certainly no wave function has infinite uncertainty in x and y. And then in the z direction, a periodic potential is usually incorporated. So you have periodic boundary conditions. And then you can normalize it, in which case it's a volume normalization and the dimensions of psi sub zero will be one divided by length to the three halves. So contrast this to a spherical wave, which is by nature in three dimensions. After all, it's a sphere. And when you consider a spherical wave, you have a source. Just make it that green point there. Waves emanate from that source as spheres. And a spherical wave function has to be depicted differently than the plane wave. You should label that r. As you move out in r, the wave is going to become less and less intense. We have to write a function that gets smaller as r gets larger. And in fact, the wave function for a spherical wave is an amplitude times e to the i k vector dot r vector divided by r. The k vector is pointing in the same direction as the r vector. k dot r is typically just kr. And in this case, the dimensions of psi 0 again come out to 1 over root length because the normalization is psi squared dv. Well, that's psi 0 squared integral of dv over that r squared because it's wave function squared. And so if you look at the dimensions, Psi 0 squared must have dimensions of 1 over length. So psi 0 is still 1 over root length. And just as a by the way, if you wrote this in two dimensions, so that these aren't spherical waves, they're just circular waves like water ripples in a pond going out. In two dimensions, uh, you would have to write psi is psi 0 e to the i k dot r over the square root of r just as a curiosity, but we're going to do three-dimensional problems. Plane waves and spherical waves are clearly depicted differently mathematically, e to the i k z versus e to the i k dot r over r. It's going to be important in our analysis to be able to write them in terms of expansions of each other. What makes it so important is that in a scattering problem, you have a scattering center, along comes a plane wave, and it scatters, giving you a spherical wave and the original plane wave. And so the scattered state has both plane wave and spherical waves. So you have to add them together. It's a lot less awkward to add them together if one of these two waveforms is expanded in the function space of the other one. What we're going to do is expand the plane wave 
in spherical waves using Rayleigh's formula, so useful both in optics and in quantum mechanics. So a plane wave can be expanded in Legendre polynomials using the combination of Legendre polynomials and spherical Bessel functions. I recommend that you go back to Griffith's section 4.1 and review the spherical Bessel functions. They are presented in the example in that section on the spherical potential well. So the Rayleigh formula gives you the plane wave e to the i k z, and it's a sum in these spherical Bessel functions and Legendre polynomials, which we know are useful in spherical symmetry. That's i to the l, that's the square root of minus 1 raised to the l. It's a sum on l equals 0 to infinity, l is just an index. What it is an index for is the spherical Bessel function and the Legendre polynomial. And you can find these two functions in tables 4.1 and 4.4. So this will be an important relation for us because it allows plane wave and spherical waves to be meaningfully combined into one formula. There's another term that comes up in spherical waves and that's the term isotropic. When a plane wave scatters off of a scattering center, we assume the scattering to be isotropic. Isotropic means everything is the same in all dimensions. So for example, a speaker might emit sound waves isotropically, the same in all dimensions. Or maybe the speaker is shaped like a waveguide so that it's stronger in, in one direction, therefore it's you know, directional, not isotropic. But when a plane wave scatters off of a scattering center, there's a very clear isotropic character to it. And now for that, I need to draw a fairly detailed picture. First, a uh, XYZ coordinate system. And I'll put a scattering center at the origin. So this is whatever object is scattering an incoming plane wave. I'll draw the incoming plane wave. There's an incoming plane wave vector. I'll call it K incident. The incoming plane wave has a wave function, we'll call it psi incident, and you know it's just an amplitude times e to the i k z. And then it hits the scattering center. A lot of this plane wave just blows right by, right? It's it maybe far away from the scattering center, and so you get plane wave continuing. I'll draw it lightly here. Perhaps a little bit weaker or a lot weaker, depending on how much of that plane wave becomes spherical wave on account of the scattering. Okay, let's use some intuition on this. Most of that spherical wave is going to be in the forward positive z direction. There's going to be a lot less of it backscattered probably, only because the plane wave has more extent than the scattering center. I would expect that as I go out here away from the z-axis, the wave is going to get weaker. It probably will. There may be cases where it doesn't, but I'm going to say for sure that the intensity of this spherical wave along one of these crests I drew is not constant. You may have a larger intensity of wave in one place than you have in another place. So let's not assume that it's the same. So I'm going to pick out a point here in space, draw an R vector that connects that point. It's elevated above the Z axis by some angle, theta, and it's separated from the y and z axis by some angle phi. This horizontal dashed burgundy line is parallel to the z axis. This angle is phi. So it depicts how much this r vector is rotated off of the z axis. You can also look at that angle in the yz plane by projecting that r vector into the yz plane and looking at it there too, but they're the same either place. Let's put ourselves over here looking from the vantage point of the source of that plane wave. So here's an eyeball, eye. That's you looking down the z-axis at this plane wave. What do you see? Here's the z-axis going away from you. That's the plane wave moving away from you. 
When the wave arrives at the scattering center at the origin, out goes a spherical wave. And you're close enough maybe that you can see that spherical wave going out. And I just want to look at an element of that spherical wave. And that element contains this point. And it is on a circle, which is annular. And so this annulus is capturing scattered wave, calling the scattered wave psi subscatter, and considering it in general a function of theta and phi, I'm going to suggest it probably decreases in amplitude as theta increases, although that may not be all the time the case. But it certainly depends on theta, and that's really the point. As you go to different thetas, you're going to find that you have different amplitude along here. But what doesn't happen, because I look at this scattered wave, I see cylindrical symmetry in this situation. So that everywhere along this annulus, I'm going to capture the same amount of scattered wave. And points on this annulus have different values of phi. So I'm going to suggest that this is independent of phi. That's going to be an assumption we'll work with going forward, that the scattered wave amplitude only depends on theta, and that it is symmetric in phi. And when we say the scattering wave amplitude is isotropic, that's what we really mean, that it is independent of phi. I think a better way to visualize the angle phi than maybe the way I have it drawn here is to look at the conic section formed by the wave scattering off of the scattering center into the angle theta off of the z-axis. And the angle phi might be more easily visualized as rotating around the conic. And because of symmetry of the problem, the wave doesn't know phi equals 0 from phi equals pi from phi equals 3 eighths pi or any other angle. It has the same effect, and that's the meaning of isotropic in phi. But theta has to have an effect because you can't have the same amplitude for perfectly forward scattered waves as 90 degree scattered waves as perfectly back scattered waves. It's going to vary significantly, but it is not going to depend on where on this circle you are located. The angle phi tells you where you are on that circle. And it's going to be independent of that. So that's the meaning of isotropic. Now that's everything I had to tell you about plane waves at the moment. We also need to talk about solid angles because we have to integrate over a whole bunch of them. And scattering cross-section is a function of solid angles. So that will be uh, another video.